Whenever I pick up a bottle of wine, I always like to turn it around, look at the back label. I want to know where is it from, who imported it, how did it get here? And at this show next door, I think I counted about 20 different countries represented with wines and spirits, California, Colorado as well. And they all have an individual story of how they got here. And I did have to look at Google Maps because I'm in our California office, uh, but we're 5.9 miles away from Red Hook Container Terminal. That's one of the six container terminals at the Port of New York, New Jersey. Now, how many of you here bring in freight through this port or any port, just so I know? How many of you have visited a container port? Show of hands. If you bring in international products, I can only recommend it. It's a fascinating look at the world of international shipping, which is why I'm here today to talk about a supply chain. And as Lauren mentioned, my experience comes from 14 years with JF Hillebrand. And next year, JF Hillebrand is going to celebrate 175 years, which I think is older than any of us here in the room. It's a big milestone. And if you don't know who JF Hillebrand is, we're an international logistics provider and we transport wine, spirits, and beer. That is our core business, what you do. We don't do general cargo or um, soybeans or uh, consumer goods. Now, um, I wanted to just take you a little bit through just what's happening. No matter what size or what type of product you're bringing in, whether you have a complex supply chain or just bringing in a couple pallets of wine getting started, what's happening in the industry is going to affect you, no matter what size you are. So let me just kind of give you a bigger picture of what's happening. Transport is it's supply and demand, and we always talk about how it's cyclical. But when I went and looked at an economic indicator, I pulled the world GDP growth, it's actually trending up over time, and it doesn't show any signs of slowing down, barring unforeseen economic events. And then I took the orange, which is the evolution of container ship size. As there is more demand, you need more supply. So shipping lines have been increasing the size of their cargo ships. Makes sense. More freight, maybe more problems. And what has really happened is in the past few years, it's just it's, it's increased phenomenally. And all this puts some pressure on port infrastructure. Certainly in the Asia Pacific trade, they had a head start, but ports in the East Coast and Gulf had to get big ship ready. This involves dredging channels, involves raising the Bayonne Bridge here, getting, they just got four new, brand new cranes at the Port of New Jersey. And along with that, you have to deal with automation to make the cargoes flow at the port. All the land side operations have to work smoothly, so more automation sometimes run into conflict with labor unions. Now the East Coast Gulf Port Master Contract expires September 30th. It's quiet, they're negotiating. We'll be keeping an eye on that, but that can really disrupt the transport chain. You also have a lot of environmental considerations and government compliance. And all this feeds into the shipping industry where just five years ago, we were working with about 20 different shipping lines. So you had a lot out there. Now, just five or six control like 71% of the global capacity for all commodities. And all these alliances work together, all these shippers, work, um, carriers work together in shipping alliances. So they're pooling their vessels or sharing space on vessels so that they don't have to finance seven or eight, 18,000 TEU container ships. 18,000 TEUs, when I say TEUs, it's 20 equivalent unit, it's the slots for the container ships. So, all this impacts you as a shipper because you have less flexibility in how many sailings are coming from your origin country if you're bringing in internationally. So let's take an example just to 
kind of conceptualize this. Let's say you bring in champagne from France to the East Coast. Okay, champagne, you're going to ship out of probably Le Havre or Antwerp. And that's in the shipping world, we call that the North Europe, North Atlantic. And you could probably go to different carrier websites, find 11 shipping companies that can offer you that service. But there's really only three global shipping alliances on that trade. And this impacts your supply chain greatly because you're not, you don't have sailings every few days. You have maybe one sailing a week. And from there, the conversation moves away from the flexibility and the transit time and, and schedules to price, space, and equipment availability. And here is where you work with freight forwarders or ocean transport intermediaries to that, that ship your same commodity so that they can use their global buying power to go to the contract, to go to the carriers and contract for space and allocation, as we call space in, in, the, in uh, the shipping industry. And then also equipment. And equipment is going to depend on the container imp import and export imbalances in the country of origin that you're bringing it from. So, Work, working with providers allows you to bundle shipments and get more rate stability. I remember when I started you, you could, could have an ocean freight rate good for a year. It's not going to happen that way because the shipping industry, like any capacity driven market, you have to balance overbooking and no shows. If not enough cargo shows up, they're going to skip a sailing. They'll call it a blank sailing. If too much cargo shows up, you get a rolled booking. So it's really where we can get forecasting and commitment from both uh, the suppliers that you're working with as well as your inbound volumes, then you can have better outcomes in the industry. Now, once you get your freight on board a vessel in North Europe, then where is it going to go? All these three alliances are competing for New York, New Jersey. It's the first port of call. It's next to a big consumer market. And you can see on this chart, it, it gets about nine port calls a week. So if you wanted to ship to Boston, it's, you're going to have to really manage your lead times because the carriers are not going to Boston. Now, this leads into a situation where the port of New York, New Jersey, as more volume comes in, gets a lot more congested. And if you're curious, this shows the ports in the U.S. by volume, TEU volume, which is 20 equivalent unit, and the West Coast gets the most on the Trans-Pacific trade, but now that the Panama Canal has expanded, bigger ships are going to the East Coast, and we're going to see a lot more coming out of... Um, South Atlantic as well, where they're doing a lot of investment in even port-to-rail intermodal options. So according to Maersk, 24% of global container trade involves the U.S. So timing is everything here when it comes to congestion. Now, I don't know if you've heard of demurrage, detention, but just a real brief rundown. Demurrage is after your container arrives at the port and before it's picked up by a trucker, that's kind of considered port storage, and it's called demurrage. You get a free time. It can be two to five days. It depends if you have a reefer container or operating reefer container or a dry container, which port it is and how long it's been there. It's prorated. It goes up. Nothing goes down. And um, after that, you get demurrage accruing if it stays there, because ports have to keep cargo moving. Once it's picked up and goes out to delivery and before it comes back empty, you get a certain amount of free time as well. And then detention starts hitting. It's also called per diem, it's a daily rate. And there's also, not to be confused with driver detention, when the truck driver drayage provider is at your receiving warehouse, it used to be a standard two-hour window for them to wait and unload. Now it's pushed down to even one. And I'll touch a little bit about uh, what's happening in the trucking industry. So one of the 
things that you need to start looking at with your supply chain is where can you find business synergies. If you have your freight provider, your customs broker, and your drayage uh, trucker operating independently in separate companies, separate silos, you're not going to have any benefits from automation or um, streamlining paper, paperwork flow. You want to go as digital as you can to avoid racking up to merge because your container is not cleared because the, you don't have the paperwork. The other thing is, is anyone um, shipping to Chicago or other markets? Because if you do, um, if you bring it in for no furrow to Chicago, for example, you want to make sure you clear your cargo at the port of entry, which would be uh, Norfolk, and not wait till the container yard, when you moved it to rail, to Chicago. Chicago is one of the markets where truck power is really tight right now, and you don't want to have demerge problems at the container yard inland. Also, unless you have complicated logistics supply chain where you have enough volume to do an overweight arrangement or a heavyweight program where there are certain corridors in certain markets, ship legal road weight. This kind of feeds into the trucking, but as truckers have more freight than they can handle, they can be choosier about what freight they're going to take on. And if your container is pushing the border of the U.S. road weight limits, which are lower here than they are in other markets, Europe and Asia, they can, they can do more on the road, then the trucker is, is going to pass up that cargo or charge you a premium or delay it. So just, just some straightforward information there. Now, onto the trucking industry and what's happening, which has just gone um, in a totally different direction since um, mid last year, I would say. And the, the trucking economy, there is just so much demand out there and not enough supply. I, I um, found truckstop.com said there is about, in early April, 60 loads per truck. And the baseline for the past three years has been 10 loads per truck. So you can see it's, it's, it's um, truckers are, are increasing their rates. There's also the electronic logging device mandate, which is a safety feature to, for the transport trucking industry world to keep drivers in hours of compliance. Hours of compliance is how much time a driver can be on duty before taking a mandatory rest period. And it's 660 minutes or 11 hours. But that includes time waiting at the terminal to pick up the empty container, waiting at the supplier's warehouse to unload, it, it, waiting time for fuel. So they need to turn a certain amount of cargo so where this really impacts is in the longer haul market. So anything about 450 miles, it used to be like a one day, you could do it in a day, now it's taking two days. And don't forget our highway infrastructure and congestions all feed into this piece. So what, um, what you should really look at, um, especially if you work in markets like Chicago, Memphis, um, Atlanta, those are really, tight capacity markets, but you're going to simply have to do more advanced planning. I mean, trying to pick up a, a last minute trucker, you're going to pay a premium for that because they have uh, plenty of options. So five to seven days is, is great. It's much better um, to make sure you have the capacity. Also, if you're bringing in import, we can kind of see when the freight is coming. So that allows us to work with providers and say, hey, we've got this amount um, ready for you as well. Now, um, the Journal of Commerce posted something that was really nice about warehouses being the shipper of choice because warehouses get a reputation in the trucking world. So you want to have warehouses that will be flexible with their delivery windows or use appointments or do drop and hook operations or even have driver amenities so that they'll, there's Google ratings on warehouse. So bear that in mind. Now the other option is certainly when the over the road market is so tough, then what about rail? Now rail has always been a viable option for some markets. It's not for everyone. 
Um, certainly it doesn't make sense in very short haul moves, but uh, there has been a lot of infrastructure investment in rail, but you still have to consider that you have trucking at the origin and the destination. So bear that in mind. The transit time is much improved now that the hours of service compliance is in place and it's always been more cost economical uh, as an option. So talk with your providers and say, you know, if you're doing inland areas, this might be an option for you. And I can't talk about supply chain disruption without talking about the weather incidents that we've had just in the past 12 months alone. And this really feeds into what is happening in the trucking, why there is so much demand, because as these we had back-to-back -back hurricanes, wildfires, um, even the winter storms here. You had three back-to-back. -back. It takes a lot of capacity off the road uh, because they have to rebuild. And here is where you can try to use big data as your friend. And I don't know how many other providers do, but we offer predictive risk analysis. So you can take a look at um, when you're shipping, what time of year, you want to look to make sure if you get a rate, you want to find out where it's transshipping. So if it is transshipping in Freeport, Bahamas in the middle of hurricane season, you know that you're going to have to do some extra um, space to, you're going to have to protect your cargo. It's going to be sitting in a hot port for maybe a week and if there's a disruption, it's not going to get catch the weekly connection. And so for high value temperature sensitive products such as wines, we recommend using an operating reefer wherever possible because that will give you guaranteed temperature control. Now in some markets, because there's high demand for perishables or produce, they may not always be an option. So in those situations, you would want to use some type of insulation device. And you can even get temperature and humidity sensors that you can stick inside the insulation kit so you know when, you, when it gets here what your cargo has been exposed to and if you need to have it rest before it goes to the market um, or not. It's also an um, insurance piece. Most cargo transport insurance providers will cover you for heating and freezing if it's in a operating reefer, some will do if it's an insulation device, but if it's in a dry container, you're on your own. They're not going to protect for that. So also take a look at your insurance policy and to see what it covers because there are some unique risks that are inherent in international shipping that you're not going to, may not be covered by your just regular um, business policy. And then just last but not least, I'm just looking ahead and where technology is going to drive us forward. And just to give an example, uh, in California, we worked with a company that was started by a, a winemaker actually. And she built an IT platform that connected everyone in the wine trade. So it was visible for uh, the producers, the brokers, and the re restaurant retail chain. This is warehouse to retail, what we call last mile logistics. And this was unique because it was based around user experience. And I think most of us as consumers now think about user experience more and more. And this tailor approach worked for us because we've always tailored our IT systems around our, our industry. And so I think where everyone asks, are there going to be driverless trucks and how is IT going to reshape it? And, and there's a lot of speculation out there. But I think what will differentiate providers moving forward is how they apply the technology and do they have the back power um, network that they need to execute it. Because you still might need to find a trucker in Czech Republic or you know, how are they going to connect. Until the industry all gets on the same page and GPS is available everywhere, it's, 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 a, it's a tougher market to disrupt as easily. So maybe, maybe in five years this, this conversation will be completely different. But I think we have some time for questions. 
two minutes. Anyone? Oh, is there a mic? as importers um, and distributors understand the... I think I made this Sorry. Hello? Oh, sorry. Um, from a distribution standpoint domestically, how can you explain the vast pricing differences between Hillebrand and your competitors? So pricing is a good one, and we already heard earlier, but on domestic, um, we offer, it's, uh, depending if you're doing a full 53-foot load or you're doing a consolidation, we offer consolidation services in our temperature-controlled warehouse, and then we have insulated trucks or temperature-controlled trucks to the markets on the East Coast. Is that what you're talking about? Just, um, I think they call it LTL. Yeah, LTL. LTL. And so if maybe look, like pallets, if you're, shipping, if you're shipping pallets from, say, one port or a pickup from a warehouse to, um, to, our, to any distributor in any state? So where our, our core business is really to the East Coast, and we have two weekly trucks going to the East Coast. So if, if Kansas, we're trying to get into Chicago markets, and um, Miami as well, we have a weekly truck. So it will depend on where you're going, for sure. So, you know, check with your pricing person as well, but um, we're not covering the whole 50 states there uh, on the truck, but we're doing the, the major markets, which in the US for the consumption is New York, New Jersey, California, Miami, and then we're Chicago, I think Louisiana, um, uh, Georgia, was in that area too. Okay, thank you. Thank you.